Is that okay with everyone, uh, uh, Stephen? Yeah. Let's okay. Start. All right. So before we start, um, I'd like to thank to thank and welcome everyone for joining us this evening for this event. We are so excited uh, about this event and your participation in the event as well. Um, I'd like to introduce uh, our two panelists today, Lily Habash, Dr. Lily Habash Hilal. Uh, Dr. Lily Habash Hilal is the film producer. She served in many advisory positions in the Palestinian Authority during the period of 94 to 2009 uh, and played an instrumental role in the establishment of several Palestinian Authority institutions, including the Negotiation Support Unit uh, and the Prime Minister's Office. Since 2009, she worked in several senior positions related to governance and policy reform in UNDP Palestine and UNDP Libya, Afghanistan and Iraq. Uh, in 2009, from 2009 to 2017, as well as Niger in 2020. The very busy schedule. <laughs> um, Dr. Um, Dr. Habash has a diverse educational background, including a BA in philosophy from Greece, a higher post academic diploma from the School of National Administration in Paris, uh, and MA and International Relations in Palestine, an EMBA uh, from Kellogg Northwestern University in Chicago, a, a diploma in diplomatic policy from JF, uh, JF Kennedy School of Government from Harvard, and a PhD in politics from the University of Exeter, UK. Um, uh, Dr. Habas has been active in the Palestinian civil society and was instrumental in founding leading and serving on boards of directors of several Palestinian NGOs related to youth, women, development, media, art, and Palestinian Christian in the OPT. Lily is also a regional and global activist and was twice recognized as a young global and Arab leader for her leadership and vision uh, for development by the World Economic Forum, Davos, in 1999 and 2003. Lily was also recognized for her effort in peacemaking by the Women for World Peace Circle. Lily's interest in various uh, varies uh, on issues relating to Palestine question, the European foreign policy toward Palestine, human security, religious tolerance, governance, and women's role in politics. She has also published several articles on Palestinian statehood, peace, and women at the local and international level. So we are so excited to have you with us. And uh, uh, and I would like to uh, introduce also, uh, so Lily, uh, good to have you with us. Thank uh, you very much, uh, This Brian. is a great opportunity. Um, I'd like to introduce our second panelist uh, is uh, Dr. Stephen uh, Gastier is an associate professor of sociology at Michigan State University. His research focuses on community development, environmental justice, and the political ecology of landscape change with specific attention to food, energy, water, and public health. Recent research has addressed the food access and impacts uh, urban greening uh, in a small US cities, alternative energy uh, and community action, environmental equ uh, equity in the access of water to sanitation and water governance. Dr. Geister was a 2015-16 Fulbright Scholar in Bir Zayt uh, University in Ramallah, Palestine Territories. Dr. Geister, uh, Geister's previous position include Assistant Professor of Human and Community Leadership Development at the University of Alona. That's my alma mater, so that's where I come from. <laughs> Uh, 2005 and 2008, Research and Policy Director at the Rural Community Assistant Partnership in Washington, D.C., 2002-2005, Research Consultant on Issues of Global Water Governance, 2001-2002, UNAIS, Project uh, Worker 
and agro ecosystem research at the Applied Research Institute Jerusalem and the Palestine Institute for Arid Lands and Environmental Studies, Palestine Territories 1993 and 96, Program Associate for the Community of Unsustainable Agriculture, World Resources in 1991-93. He, he was a Peace Corps volunteer in Mali from 1987 through 1990, and he received a BA from Earthlam uh, College in 97 and a, BH, and a PhD in sociology from Iowa State University in 2001. So I'd like to welcome both panelists. Uh, so our uh, today's movie uh, is going to be, before we show the documentary, I'd like to tell you uh, a little bit about Patriarch Emeritus Michael uh, Sabah. Uh, in, 19, uh, in 1987, the, the Patriarch was appointed by the Pope, Pope John II, as the Latin Patriarch of Jerusalem, uh, the first Arab Patriarch to, to hold the office in the Catholic Church history. His work has marked significant milestones in the struggle against injustice and oppression to bring peace uh, to the country. So without, so without further ado, so let's uh, watch the video uh, from uh, Patriarch Sabah, and then we'll come back to our panel and panel discussion. Okay, let's see if this works, I think. Can you hear this? We cannot okay. hear this. Yeah, give me one second. Let me see. Probably have to do something with the set in. Sorry. Sorry, one second, let me uh, do the okay. set in. Okay, just getting some technical help here and then I'll be right back. Yeah, there we go. Good. لا يختلف اثنان هذه الأيام على أن الشعب الفلسطيني يمر في أسوأ منعطف في تاريخه غزة تخنق بالنار والحصار والضفة تمزق بالاستيطان والجدران والقدس القدس صعبة المنال وملايين اللاجئين القابعين في مخيمات البؤس يربون أمل العودة أصبحت فلسطينهم أبعد من السماء تصف البلاد أمام أعيننا في طريقة لم يشهد لها التاريخ مثيل أصبح الفلسطيني غير قادر على فهم ما يدور حوله من ظلم الأعداء وتخلي الأشقاء هل أزدلت الستار على فلسطين؟ أم أن هناك فجر جديد؟ في قرية باركها المسيح واحتمى بها في آخر أيام حياته هناك رجل في الثمانين من عمره منعزل يتعبد 
ويصلي من أجل فجر جديد سلاحه المحبة وكرامة الإنسان أي إنسان الواقع أننا في أسوأ الأحوال مش عارفين هل سوف تأتي مرحلة كما أنا أسوأ اليوم أزيل القناع لن تكون لكم دولة أمامنا خياران نبلع السم المقدم لنا أقبل كيان وأكل وشرب أو نبقى في المقاومة وتبقى الإرادة أننا شعب ولنا سيادتنا ويجب أن نكون يوما أسيادا أنا لست سياسي ولا أنا محارب ولا أنا مناضل أنا رجل دين مسيحي ومسؤول عن الرعية مسؤولية الراعي المسيحي مسؤولية شاملة للإنسان يوجد وضع ظلم وضع احتلال معناته أنا مسؤول إنها العاشرة صباحا أعزائنا المستمعين أسعد الله صباحكم من إذاعة المملكة الأردنية الهاشمية في عمان نقدم لكم موجزا بأهم وآخر الأنباء يعود اليوم إلى القدس غبطة البطريرك ميشيل صباح بعد أن تم تعيينه بطركا للقدس من قبل بابا الفاتيكان ليكون بذلك أول عربي يحصل على هذا المنصب منذ أكثر من 500 عام يعود البطريرك اليوم والقدس مشتعلة بعد أن بدأ الشعب الفلسطيني انتفاضته المجيدة من أجل التخلص من براثين الاحتلال الإسرائيلي. لما تم تعيين بطريرك الصحافه كانت 
بالعشرات والعشرينات كانوا موجودين لما نزلت من الطائرة إلى صالون الاستقبال في مطار روما سألوا طبعا سؤالهم ماذا ستعمل ماذا ستقول وماذا كذا وأنا جوابي كان بكل بساطة سأرى سأذهب إلى القدس عندما أعود إلى القدس سأرى ماذا أقول Beit Zahur was placed under military siege for weeks and goods worth millions of dollars were confiscated because the people refused to pay taxes to the occupying power. Throughout the siege of Beit Zahur, the army repeatedly used force to seize people's belongings. وقلنا يجب أن نساعد الناس الناس في الضيق تحت حصار لابد من أن نعمل شيء توجهنا البطارك الثلاث قابلنا الحاكم العسكري الإسرائيلي قال لنا لا يمكن أن تذهبوا إلى بيت صحراء لا يسمح لكم بالدخول الصحافي طبعا بتتابع وصار في سؤال عن الانتفاضة أو جواب ساعتها هذا يمكن أول جواب وتدخل أنه الشعب له حق لحريته والشعب على حق في الانتفاضة ساعتها نسبة لإسرائيل عرفت شو أنا أنا مع الشعب الفلسطيني ليس لأني فلسطيني أنا مع الشعب الفلسطيني لأني إنسان لأني مسيحي لأني مؤمن بكرامة كل إنسان الفلسطيني والإسرائيلي الفلسطيني هو المظلوم فأنا معه لأنه مظلوم طال هذا الظلم ومن أكثر الناس اللي دفعوا وبدفعوا ثمن هذا الظلم رعيتك المسيحيين لم يبقى مسيحيين في فلسطين الهجرة مزقت المجتمع المسيحي في فلسطين هلا سبب الهجرة الوضع السياسي لا أكثر ولا أقل أول هجرة للمسيحيين من القدس ومن غير القدس سنة 48 كان المسيحيين نسبتهم 7% 9% من السكان الهجرة الكبرى للمسيحيين صارت في 48 و67 صار كمان هجرة تانية فالأوضاع السياسية هي السبب وليس الكل مستعدين لأن يعيشوا حياة فيها حرب
أكثر من نصف المسيحيين في الشرق الأقل في العراق وسوريا وهون هاجر دمروا العراق يدمرون اليوم سوريا مصر في حالة اضطراب مستمر يجب تدمير الموجود الشرق الأوسط موجود لخلق شرق أوسط جديد وفي تدمير هذا الشرق الأوسط كل شيء يدمر المسلم والمسيحي والسني والشيع وكل ما هنالك ولا يهمهم ماذا يحصل للمسيحي مطلقاً أمات المسيحي مات بقي فقط لا خلاص إلنا إلا في شعبنا إذا عرفنا إحنا مكاننا في شعبنا ومع شعبنا عرفنا نأمن حالنا قال مسؤولون أمريكيون إن الرئيس دونالد ترامب سيعترف اليوم بالقدس عاصمة لإسرائيل ويطلق عملية نقل السفارة الأمريكية من تل أبيب إلى مدينة القدس التاريخية. Exactly 70 years ago, the United States under President Harry Truman became the first nation to recognize the state of Israel. Today we officially open the United States Embassy in Jerusalem. Congratulations. أمريكا أغلقت أبواب السلام خلاص في هذا الموقع أنت وقفت وبكيت على القدس القدس لكثرة الخطايا فيها اللهم ما زلنا نبكي معك على مدينتنا ومدينتك المقدسة ما زالت الخطايا تملؤها الحرب والموت والكراهية اللهم بدل كل هذا أعد القداسة إلى مدينتك واملأها بحبك أمين القدس اليوم ليست مدينة مقدسة مدينة كراهية القدس اليوم مدينة حرب تعود مدينة مقدسة عندما تعود مدينة محبة عندما يعود الشعبان كلهم أهل محبة إذ ذاك تعود القدس مدينة مقدسة عندما تعود مدينة محبة يا سيد رامب أنت غلطان أنت رجل تظلم شعب كان الوعد في أوسلو أنه سنة التسعة وتسعين تعلن الدولة تنتهي المشاكل بدل ذلك استمروا في طريق الحرب
Allah sahil aleyhi Allah. Jaz santet la tutu sayin. Binan ala ittifaqiyya. Ittifaqiyya dawliyya. ثم تطورت الأمور والدول لم تحترم عهودها ولا إسرائيل فرض عليه الحصار فعزل عزلوه الله سهل عليه يجب أن يدخل رئيس دولة وليس رئيس منظمة تحت أوامر إسرائيل هذه الغلطة الأساسية كل شغلة أصله هاي كان يجب أن يدخل رئيس دولة المهم نرجع لإحنا الواقع هو العالم كله متفق علينا مع إسرائيل الأمام هذا الموت الماثل أمامنا كيف بدنا نخلص حالنا قيل لنا لا حق لكم بالوجود هذا ما قيل لنا والذي قاله لنا هم حكام الأرض اليوم أمريكا وإسرائيل سبعين سنة مرة وتوصلنا إلى هذا يجب أن يسير تفكير شامل مفتوح مناقشة عامة لماذا وصلنا إلى هذه الحالة يجب أن نعرف أننا أمام موت فيجب أن نكون جديين حتى في أمورنا البسيطة نربي أبناءنا على أن يكونوا كلهم كفاءات قادرة على العيش وقادرة على المحبة بمفهوم المحبة الذي يعرف أن يكلم القاتل نفسه بهذا هذا الخط الذي يجب أن نعيش فيه أمل بقاء عدم هرب إحنا في مواجه بين موت وحياة لا يجوز أن نسمح إلنا بالفساد إحنا الفساد عنا بجوع الشعب وبحرم الشعب إحنا ما عناش ولا إشي لانقسام فساد لانقسام فساد يجب أن نستخدم عقلنا بكل طاقاته وكل ما لدينا من طاقات عقلية لا يستثنى أحد الصغير والكبير والمسلم والمسيحي الكل يفكر حتى نخرج بكلام برؤية عاقلة وكلام عاقل ندخل به المرحلة الجديدة بعد سبعين سنة مرة
هلا كيف يمكننا ان نعمل الوسيله الاولى البقاء عدم الياس انا موجود اليوم معناته ساوجد غدا ان انا ازلت نفس اليوم طبعا لن اوجد غدا ان انا غلبني الياس اليوم لن اوجد غدا يجب أن لا يغلبني اليأس يجب أن يبقى الأمل في أنا اليوم موجود غدا سأوجد موجود اليوم خاضع مخضع غير سيد سأوجد يوما سيدا غير خاضع لما ميشيل صباح بيختلب ميشيل صباح كيف بصير الخراف انا انسان واحد من اختليت اختليت امام ربي وانا رجل صلاه انا احول كل حياتي وحياه الشعب كله إلى صلاة أقول يا رب تطلع من السماء وانظر لماذا تسمح بكل هذا الناس يموتون الناس يظلمون أبناؤك خليقتك قاتلون ومقتولون أنت خلقت إنسانا كريما عزيزا اللهم احمي واهدي البشرية كلها أنا أحول كل شيء إلى صلاة وابتهال أمام الله وأضع كل شيء بين يديه تعالى وأقول له يا رب أن تدبر هذه البشرية Can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Excellent, excellent. I don't know where my picture has gone. I did something. <laughs> Maybe it's the video in the bottom. Could be the video in the bottom. You came back for an instant. It just came back instantly and then it went away. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, we can see it. Uh, it went away. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so welcome uh, back, everyone. Um, and uh, we will open a floor for questions. So you can type your questions actually in the Q&A session and the, uh, uh, the panelists will be happy to answer your questions. But um, I'd like to start first, Lily, if you can give us 
um, a, an idea about the movie and about the struggle um, that's taken place in uh, Palestine um, with the, you know, and, and the circumstances in which Palestinians find themselves right now that are, uh, ha and that is very well um, uh, projected by uh, Patriarch uh, Sabah and how he views this vision of unity between all races and, and love between all races. If you can give us uh, your vision of the movie to start with, uh, and we'll take it from there. Sure, thank you, Brahim, and hello for all participants. I'd like to thank you all for your time and effort to see this movie. Um, well, as you have seen, Brahim, I think that uh, the beauty of the film is that it, it actually summarizes the Palestine question in yeah. like 27 minutes. And uh, as I always said, that the patriarch has like almost 10 statements, short, concise, and up to the point. And uh, I think this is what is sad, like it's been more than, it's actually the conflict is almost like uh, 100 years old, but basically, I mean, the heart of the conflict can be depicted as, uh, you know, since, um, you know, the Nakba in 1947. Um, so I think that it comes very timely because there's a lot of uncertainty, especially uh, for the Palestinian people. I can understand that the whole world is, un in, is facing uncertainty now, but for the Palestinians, after COVID-19 ends, they will still have a lot of painful uh, life and uh, painful history. Um, as you have seen, I think that, the, I mean, I wanted to do the, the film about the patriarch, and I have to say this story, that it was initially to commemorate his uh, his life and uh, to make sure that the people know him and know his philosophy and theology in life. I never expected the, the film to turn out to be the way it is. And that was like, I think that the genius of the, the film director who is not with us today because he developed a close relationship with the patriarch. And then they started discussing all those issues that are very crucial to the Palestinian existence. Today, as you have seen, he says, like, we need to exist. If we exist today, then we exist tomorrow. And it, it, be, it became sort of a very important message uh, to, to tell people that they should not lose hope and that we have to be united again. <clears throat> as he said, like, division uh, cor uh, is corruption and it, it's actually uh, hurting the people and our cause. And I think that uh, what, what I like about the film is that it sends a, a universal message again. It's very simple words coming from a Christian uh, leader. And he's just telling everybody we have to start loving each other. And he, he is trying to remind the world that there's a big problem that needs to be resolved not only because it's very political and you know all international law and whatever, but it's because it's because uh, you know it stands for a universal value, which is uh, freedom of oppression and just you know justness and dignity for all. And uh, this is the message that came uh, through the film, and I hope that the people liked it. And uh, I will stop here and wait for more questions. <laughs> Um, so I, I can take, so this is great. Thank you so much. I really um, shed lights on the uh, current situation in, in, in Palestine and the, the challenges that especially the Christian community also faces, especially in light of the um, migration that was mentioned earlier. But this is not something that, uh, this is something that the whole Palestinians have also experienced. Um, and it's, it's very concerning when we see that there is a, uh, in, and uh, as the Petrarch mentioned in Iraq, and there is in Syria and other uh, countries, how we see that the, 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 this state of instability has actually affected all of these communities and affected all of these countries and has made a, a, a devastating effect, uh, um, a lasting effect too on the fabric of these societies that we're seeing a lot of migration out of the, the, the countries. So um, 
I want to and I take the point to Stephen here and from your um, your observation, Stephen, and you've worked a lot in the Palestine Israel area. How do you see um, this the notion that uh, Patriarch has talked about being materialized and how what was your experience like like in uh, bringing um, uh, in how the efforts of peace have always been um, at the forefront of the, uh, the community. I mean, the Palestinian communities have always wanted to establish a, uh, a, 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 a peaceful transition to a statehood, but it's always been, it has always faced a lot of obstacles. I mean, we were talking about 1993 and the Oslo Accord and how that did not materialize. So if you can just tell us from your experience, uh, what, you know, the things that you've seen uh, as you lived there and as also a sociologist too. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the, um, first of all, I think what's wonderful about this is that it really highlights, this film does a great job of highlighting the, the extent to which there is a mosaic, right? And so the, mm -hmm. the, the extent to which while it's a shrinking population, very much a minority, there is a, an indigenous Christian minority in Palestine, right? And they have been there. These are not converts that, you know, were the result of colonial, whatever. That's, these are indigenous Palestinian Christians. They are part, they are part of Palestinian society. Um, the problem is that um, they, as all other Palestinians, live in the context of occupation. And it's an occupation that, that really does go back to the, um, the, the Nakba, the, the, um, the efforts to create a, a Jewish state on the land and the constant expansion of that state. And so the, um, there have been forms of resistance. We start with the, um, and, and really in some ways the, the film breaks very early to the um, to the tax revolt in Beit Sahor in in the 1980s in the first Intifada, right? So the um, following 1967, Israeli put, Israel having already claimed Israel, then placed a, a military occupation on all of what's now, what's been known as the West Bank, and and began the process of military control. The, um, the, the first intifada was a resistance against that, right? The, the indignities of occupation, the day-to-day -day, um, -day efforts to make it clear that Palestinians weren't wanted, right? So um, uh, when I first went to Palestine in 1985, it was, it was before the first intifada. And yet even then to walk with, uh, um, young men my age, right? I was early 20s. To walk around Ramallah or Bethlehem was at some point to have a Jeep run up against you and to put you all up against the wall and to search you and to just because, um, and invariably they would, at that point, they would sort of freak out because they, they would put us all against the wall and then they would discover my US passports and then that, that made them all very nervous, right? It's, um, but the the whole thing was to make Palestinians feel like they weren't wanted, like they were suspects. Like, and so there was this, this um, intifada, the uprising, which involved, we hear a lot of cocktails and so on and so forth in the United States. Beit Sahur's, um, Beit Sahur was famous because the occupation was a tax rate. We don't want to pay to have your military tanks in our community. Right? So, in some ways, it, it sets up precisely what Patriarch Sabah is talking about, right? This, these resistance as staying in place, resistance as, um, as peaceful methods to recognize our very humanity, right? Our very dignity as people. And, and so in, in that sense, if we, we can think of an occupation that is about extraction of land, it is about extraction of people that gets pulled into this narrative of, you know, Islamists versus, you know, the good guys Israel, right, in our press. 
and yet it's it's so it it involves so many more day-to-day -day resistances that are just about please recognize our humanity. And I think that's that's one of the wonderful things if you you know uh, um, if you listen to what Petrarch Sabah is saying, that's what he's highlighting about the resistance and the need for resistance, right? So, um, so, so I think um, I think really thinking about that, and and he 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 contrasts that with what happens if we don't um, if we try to devalue that, right? If we say that that resistance has no justification, then you turn a holy city. Right? Jerusalem is, you know, the third holiest site for Islam. It is the holiest site for, for um, Judaism. It is also the holiest city in the world for Christians. And yet at this point, if you go through Jerusalem, it, it is, he says, it's a site of war, right? It is a site where, um, where any boy and you will see a Palestinian young man or woman being arrested or harassed by soldiers, right? You will see armed guards outside of all of the holy sites. You will see a uh, militarized presence as you go into the, um, into the different quarters. Um, you are going to see people with guns, both people in uniforms with guns and people um, and uh, Israelis with, with guns who are just walking through. It is not a holy city right now. And so to get to take this place and make it a holy city, we need to start thinking about what is the basic humanity of the people who live there, of all the people who live there, all the people who have generational ties to that place. Um, so I can stop with that. <laughs> no, great, great. Thank you so much. Uh, and that's, that's really um, uh, an important, uh, uh, these are important points that you mentioned that uh, patriarch here Sabah is really appealing to the humanity of people to the and but to also to the hope this notion of hope this is very important to the Palestinian story to the Palestinian uh, ability to uh, the Palestinians ability to uh, you know create their own uh, you know existence and to continue their own existence which has been there for you know since the dawn of, of history uh, could you talk to us, uh, Lily, about this notion of hope and clinging to hope and the Palestinian, uh, the Palestinian resistance story that this is not a story. And as, as, I, as I watch it, it's really very inspiring. As I watch it, this is talking about not just the Palestinians, it's talking about everybody in a sense. So people in humanity in a sense, and a lot of people that are in situations, so colonial situations, this is very appealing. Uh, and, you know, having come from a country that like Morocco, where we were colonized by two states, by Spain and France at the same time, like one was not enough. <laughs> so <laughs> <laughs> like one was not enough, they had to be two. So I understand like it really appeals to people that were, I mean, people that are now in situation, in such situation, but also people that were recently that in, in such situations that it is very hard to decolonize a lot of countries right now from this, this, this hegemony uh, and this, this discourses that we see. If you could talk to us about this notion of hope, I, uh, you know, and, and cling into that hope as, as, a, as a matter of existence for not just Palestinians, but beyond. You know, it's, it's in a way like, you know, if you see the film, it, it takes you from like a sort of like a sad story to mm -hmm. a glimpse of hope. Yeah. And it's, uh, and actually I have to say, you know, when you watch, we, we have been screening the film in Zoom meetings, it's a different thing because you can see the people's reaction while they are talking and seeing the film. So mm -hmm. it's very moving. As, as I have said, I think that, you know, you spoke about uh, decolonization. I think that uh, uh, we might need to think of a new concept of decolonizing the, the, you know, the colonials and the decolonized. I mean, we all are, we are all trapped in this colonial kind of uh, impasse, I think. It's a mental mm -hmm. thing. It's not only a physical thing. And this is the type of hope that he is talking about, that we need to get out a bit like perhaps of our skin and even talk to our oppressor with love. 
And this is the most uh, uh, sublime type of act that you can do, especially now, because in the case of Palestine, we have tried everything. We have tried yeah. international law. It didn't work because of the, uh, you know, like this functional structure of the UN system that has created our problem. We have tried negotiations. It didn't work. Negotiations supposedly in good faith, but how can you have good faith with your occupier and you are uh, negotiating with your occupier uh, in, a, in, in, in a process that did not initially start with the fact or, and the act of decolonization. So mm -hmm. this whole peace process is not a decolonization uh, process, unlike many other countries like you decolonize and then you have your own statehood. You decolonize, you recognize the right to self-determination, and then you think of the administrative structure. Like what we did is that we created like a, a big bubble called statehood. And we as Palestinians had sort of a wishful thinking that the Oslo agreements would come uh, up with a state, which is not the case because there is no mention whatsoever of any uh, right to self-determination or initial statehood at the end of the process. So again, that's a different thing. That's, that's the patriarch's comment about the Oslo agreements. And actually like it's like he summarized my PhD thesis in one <laughs> sentence, which is amazing. But then we go again, like as, as uh, Stephen said, like the resistance in the first uprising, I think that the director's, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, focus on Beit Sahur is very uh, symbolic because it's a reminder that we should not give in to the occupation. And there's, in a way, the patriarch is even calling us to resist. And it's very tricky, like he is asking for Christian type of resistance. Like we resist because we exist. We resist using the language of hope from the Bible, you know, and this is extremely important because, you know, in a way he is appealing to our psyche and also to the world psyche, basically the Western world, the leaders of the world who are supposed to be based on Judeo-Christian type of ethics that is not actually working, you know, because, you know, I, I, when I was thinking about what he said about hope, like he, and that's the type of hope, hope that he is pushing us to go uh, for, basically is like to see everybody in the image of God. That's the, that's the most important verses in Genesis, like, you know, we are created in the image of God. And this is the type of hope that we have to, to start thinking about is that we have to start accepting each others as equal human being. And if we accept each others as equal human beings, then we can have peace. And uh, actually, you know, it's, it's very important to try and decipher every single sentence he said, we can write a book about. But then again, he's also trying to give hope to the Palestinians, because you know when we initially made this film, uh, I, I personally did not think that it will go uh, international. I mean, then it's it, the film is starting to have a life of its own, which is good. But going back to the Palestinians, he said we have nothing but to sit and discuss and think for ourselves because we have to depend on ourselves. That's the type of hope that he is giving us, that it's okay, nobody will help us. We have to do our homework ourselves by resisting, by being steadfast and by resilience, and also because we have a just cause, you know, and this is extremely important. And frankly, the film is, is coming very timely, especially nowadays, uh, you know, and he is inducing us all to think. For example, we are having several initiatives coming out of the film, uh, Palestinian wise, to try and rethink because the patriarch is still pushing us, what can we do next? What, we, what do we have next? And actually in a couple of days, he will be 88 years old. And it, this is the type of hope that we have is that you should never give up. 
as long as you live, you have to continue striving and working hard. And uh, I mean, it cannot be, but just, I mean, even though at the end of the day, he says like, God, you have created this humanity. It's up for you to, to handle. Mm -hmm. This is very strong because even me as a Palestinian, I have always thought like, where is the wisdom in, in, in this problem, you know, why is God allowing this to happen? God is supposed to be good. I mean, I do not want to go to the notion of like the land of a chosen people and like, this is too complicated, but it's not fair. And the God that I know personally is a God of love. He, he doesn't differentiate between people. He doesn't, he's not a real estate agent, like, mm -hmm. like he promised, you know. My God is a God of love of everybody, irrespective of their color, race, religion. And I have always said, you know, the type of hope that the patriarch is telling us, like, you do not choose where, how, and where to be born. You are a human being, and that's where we start from. Uh, and I, I think, you know, many people have seen the film and the Palestinians and they, they, they feel very emotional about it. And that's good because also, unfortunately in Palestine now, we are having a, a, a crisis of uh, leadership. We don't have real leaders that are credible. The people can see that the division is eating up our society at the time when we have so many uncertainties, not only because of the occupation, but also from the social, economic, and political problem within our society, in addition to COVID-19, because also in Palestine, it's a very big problem. But again, you see, you have no other option but hope. And I, I, I hope that the message gets across, especially to young people, not only to Palestinians, but to young people all over the world. I'm not sure about the audience, if it is students, but I think that you have asked me again on hope. I think that it's a call for everybody to be hopeful that we all go back to our human uh, nature, like uh, uh, the essence of, of, of our humanity and our calling to the world. Thank you so much. Uh, and this is, uh, this is really great is because we're looking at the, the, the appeal, this appeal to our humanity, which could be the cause for um, us dissolving these problems. Because I think that at the end of the day, a lot of the conflicts that are taking place is that people fail to see each other as human beings. Uh, so, but they see the, the each other in a more compartmentalized way that this belongs to this, but this belongs to that. And this leads me to a point that you have mentioned also that he is appealing to the Palestinians to kind of, you know, get the, the, their, their home in order as well, to make sure that this cause is not really, I mean, Palestinians and Arabs and everybody has been disappointed for so many years with this political process. I mean, they've had enough with the political process and it seems that there's a disingenuous, um, disingenuous uh, desire uh, I mean, this, it's all it's, it's all this full desire actually to uh, to move the peace pro process forward. Uh, it looks like we are always stuck into this uh, you know show of negotiation. But at the end of the day, uh, we I mean, people come home empty-handed, and the, the 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 there has not been a a resolution to the core issue of statehood and core issue of uh, refugees. And core and all of these core issues that you know needs to be addressed, and they are really the reason why there's all these issues. So to, uh, to you, Stephen, um, as um, as you as as you see this struggle unfolding, can you give us a little bit like uh, sort of a, a sociolo sociological uh, 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 unpacking of the the situation as? As in, this is the reason why we're not moving forward. So we're talking about 70 years on, and it doesn't seem that we have moved the needle toward this peace process and the statehood of Palestinians, which seems to me like an obvious thing. And then comes Trump, 
um, sort of, you know, puts us back in, you know, zero, uh, back to the, the, the square one. So if you can uh, talk about uh, that, that prospect and the effect of Trump and his decisions on actually decimating this, this cause. I mean, this is a very a, a right cause for people to exist, a right cause for people to live uh, uh, peacefully and coexist. But it seems that with political actors always, they seem to be going toward um, not solving this situation. And it's all this political uh, performance in a sense. Yeah, and I think, you know, so I came away from being in Palestine uh, from 2015-2016, um, sort of set in the, in the conclusion that the Oslo process, in as much as it was ever a viable, um, a viable process, and I think that could be debated from, from 1993 mm -hmm. on, um, uh, was completely dead, right? The reality is that uh, it was set up to, to establish um, vapid political leadership. It was set up to with power imbalances that that were not resolved. The right, the the external parties, the United States in particular, but also to a certain extent, the, the EU was was never willing to step in and to try to even out that imbalance of power when when Palestinian leadership came to the table with with Israel. Um, and in fact, the Oslo process did a, did a remarkable job um, in, for instance, I, a lot of my work is on water. In the area of water, it's, you look at the um, uh, joint, joint water committee that's supposed to oversee um, the, the disbursement of water in the West Bank. And um, it's, it was set up in such a way that not only did it not rectify the imbalance of power going into the negotiations. It cemented an imbalance of power in decision making so that basically Israel, if parties in Israel, not even the full state of Israel, can veto any effort to improve access to water in the West Bank. Um, so so, it, so the, the Oslo process itself sort of cemented in place this, um, this imbalance and then um, the international parties looked the other way as Israel broke agreement after agreement and actually um, annexed as much land during the Oslo process as it had prior, right? I mean, it's the, the ongoing um, use, expulsion of Palestinians and, um, and annexation of land to Israel and putting land out of reach to Palestinians um, continued and in fact got, gained a certain legitimacy under the Oslo process. So, so uh, the intellectual energy when I was in uh, Palestine was really beyond, was really behind, let's move beyond this. Come on, let's be done with this, right? It's yeah. not surprising that there's no legitimacy to either Hamas or or Fatah because they are fully embedded in this process, in this Oslo agreement, which was never going to get you to justice. Right? Yeah. So, so you now have to think about what's next. And I think what part of what this movie does is express this notion that let's think about something else. But it then expresses as well the, the other revelation I came away from, that this is not about or solely about occupation. It is not solely about uh, something that's fully unique to Israel and Palestine. It's about a process that we call settler colonialism, right? And it is very similar to what we did here in the United States to, um, to the indigenous people of, the, of North America. It's very similar to what happened in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and, and so that um, that takes rethinking what the mode of resistance is, right? mm -hmm. because because it is this is a thing, right? And the one of the great statements about settler colonialism is the greatest act of resistance is to stay in place, is to mm -hmm. stay in place and exist for the indigenous people who are the subject of that, right? Yeah. And so so you see that again in 
Patriarch Sabbath's uh, call is we have to exist. We have to continue to have hope because ultimately the whole point of the endeavor is to get you to leave. So if you stay, if you exist, if you continue to argue for your rights, ultimately settler colonialism doesn't succeed because this is to live with you rather than simply taking over and expel you, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, so in some ways that mode of resistance, it seems to be where we're headed is we have that Palestinians have to stay in place and that is gonna involve resistance because the whole point of the endeavor is to get them to leave. And, um, and so forms of resistance that keep Palestinians in place then ultimately can create something that's different than this sort of uh, completely empty process that was the Oslo Accords. Thank you, thank you. And uh, one thing that, this is great, thank you so much, uh, Stephen, for this explanation. And this reminds me of Mahmoud Derwish's notion of solidifying and cementing the Palestinian identity, uh, not just for the Palestinians who are inside, but also for the Palestinians who are outside through his poems. He wants to, what we call in Arabic, he wants to really cement the, the, the identity of the Palestinians, their, their sense of self, their sense of history, their sense of presence, and so on and so forth. And, and that's what I wanted. I wanted to sort of broaden the scope a little bit uh, for you, Lily, to kind of uh, shed some light on us very quickly. And, and I will take the questions, please. If you have any, any Q&A for the panelists, please feel free to, uh, to uh, type them. We'll be happy to take the, uh, the, the questions. But Lily, this, this notion that uh, Patriarch Sabah has mentioned, which is really important, it, and, I, and I've seen it, and I've seen it in the bravado of, um, the bravado of George W. Bush, and the whole thing that the whole, you know, uh, uh, the whole destruction, the, the, the whole region, in a sense, where you have, and it has compounded the issues in the region, and it has, it has, sort of uh, flared the sectarian uh, divisions in Iraq, in Syria, and so on and so forth, and the mess we found ourselves right now. Uh, so it, it seems that the region, and, and as, as, uh, as Pastor Rex Abba has clearly delineated, he says that it seems that they're trying to reshape the history of the Middle East in general. And this reshaping of the, the, the history is exactly what's, what's happening also uh, microscopically or sort of a micro way inside Palestine because there's, there's, there's uh, the, 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 the confiscation of land, there's annexation of a lot of land and trying to appropriate and changing of the landscape from what they previously or historically were named to different names and so on and so forth. So all of this, if you can just give us if you can unpack it for us politically and the ramifications for that uh, on a macro level from the Palestinian and their, um, their the, the statehood of the Palestinian and also from regionally from the Middle East where we see all this chaos, which is could be attributed and is attributed to this in, in a sort of a, a, an ad hoc way of approaching a our interest first approach to the, the, the political process in the Middle East? Oh, uh, very, <laughs> sorry, it's too long, but I know it's a long question, but, no, but, but I, I like what he's, I like how he actually described it to us. This is not a local issue. This is really yeah. an, a regional issue as well. If you could please. Absolutely. Um, I mean, of course, the, the problem started before Bush and Condoleezza Rice's creative chaos in the Middle yeah. East, which ended up to be that, that much problematic. But to, to start uh, where, from where Stephen uh, ended, I think that, I mean, it's like a continuous existential uh, war. You see, it's like the negation of the other. So the, the way yeah. that the, the, the the peace process has actually contributed to efforts, Israeli efforts, and including, like, I think, in a way, I mean, forget about all the rhetoric and the declaratory rhetoric about, like, supporting the two-state solution, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. There has not, there has never been a real international decision to give the Palestinians, to accord them the right to self-determination. 
yeah. obviously. So the idea is that like the Oslo agreement is like something that is even deeper than the institutionalization of the occupation. It's the settler colonial project that is with, but what was the outcome? The, the whole process uh, issue was based on uh, fragmenting the Palestinian, uh, uh, how do I say, the Palestinian entity, like a, a national entity and identity. First of all, I mean, forget about the fact that it never really uh, um, wanted to end up with a Palestinian uh, independent or a Westphalian state, mm -hmm. okay? Just like in the real sense of statehood. The idea is that they signed an agreement with the PLO, making believe for the PLO that they have recognized it as the representative of the Palestinian people. While in fact, the, the recognition was the, the PLO as a, a, an organization now administering the day-to-day uh, -day lives of the Palestinian people in the West Bank and Gaza, not even Jerusalem, because it was out of... So what is the outcome of Oslo? We have too many peoples now in Palestine, and th that's the social aspect of it. Even though, you know, we all feel that we are, a pal we are Palestinians and we have like the unity of land, cause, and people, but in fact, now we have a, a sort of like the independent Republic of Palestine in Gaza, like Hamas. We have the independent Republic of Ramallah that is completely cut off from the north of the West Bank because the social life and the social fabric is different. So if there is a, there's a demonstration in Ramallah, the people in Jerusalem don't have a demonstration. Their, their life goes on normally. I mean, seemingly normal because they don't need to go to the demonstration in Ramallah or to the curfew in Ramallah. And that's a, a, a very dangerous fragmentation. I mean, we often don't like to talk about it, but it's a fact and it's a reality. And people are so tired that they cannot think more than like, will they, will they get their salary? Which is again, another outcome of the Oslo agreement is that they have created a pseudo dependence on a Palestinian authority that is totally a rentier type of authority that only uh, has its resources coming either from the Israeli tax money that is due to the Palestinians or the international community, which actually whose policies fluctuate uh, according to interest and uh, to geopolitical differences. And nevertheless, the good thing that is happening now, because I think that the Palestinians are reaching the bottom, there is a lot of uh, revisionary kind of like intellectual effort, as you have put it, Stephen, trying to revise that, you know, the Aust I mean, people are not really accepting, especially people in the diaspora and people in Israel who are like almost 2 million people. They're saying, well, we did not really endorse the Oslo agreement. That has actually given uh, uh, up on the rights of all the Palestinians, other than the ones who are in the West Bank and Gaza, excluding Jerusalem, by the way, because it was out of the thing. So now they say, and I'm included, I say, well, I was not consulted on this, uh, uh, you know, statehood uh, program or uh, even in, in, in the, the way that the PLO has actually accepted the idea of establishing a state on every piece of land. Like, I mean, it makes me go crazy because I say that this principle in itself is a big lie because the fact of, you know, accepting to, to establish a state on every piece of land that is being liberated means that you are accepting to have an authority under the occupation. You do not liberate unless you liberate the whole land. So they have been selling us this story and like it's a discourse that nobody is challenging and it becomes convenient to the international community who don't care as long as the Palestinians want this and then a bilateral negotiated agreement between the occupier and the occupied. I mean, how can this happen? Land for peace, how can you have peace? Anyways, so now the, the good thing is that the people are rethinking and it's sort of, I hope that it's going to be a real national awakening, even though it is going to be very difficult. The fact that 
we are having like a lot of movement, intellectual movement, basically, I don't think it's political, around the notion of elections that is coming up. We have, yeah. we are supposed to have three elections, legislative, presidential, and the national council that englobes all the Palestinians all over the world. Mm -hmm. The fact that it is happening and people are discussing in many forums, it, it's healthy. But the, the thing that is not healthy to me is that, I mean, I mean, the sad part is I think that the Palestinian intellectuals are not making the extra effort to expose the politicians. So I'm yeah. trying to think like we have to recreate a sort of uh, a triangle relationship where we have the, the intellectual, in this case, it is the patriarch in a way, mm. who is trying to empower the people to question the decisions of the, the politicians and say, let's revise. Like he is sending also sort of a defiance message to the Palestinians that we are going to defy your political decisions. And I'm hoping that this will be a good awakening. I do not see results happening in the short and perhaps medium term, but at least in the long term, if we build the awareness and we rebuild and we restructure our uh, 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 historical narrative, that's what Palestinian yeah. intellectuals are saying, that we are all one people. It is not only the people in Israel or the Palestinians in Jerusalem or in Gaza or in Ramallah. Each one has his own interest now. No, because it is not working. So th th that's the idea of many people trying to support a solution that is called the one democratic state, which many people are saying it's not going to work because we will lose our national identity. But anyways, by all means, it's not going to happen because of the fact of the settler colonial project. It's either us or you, and that is what yeah. is happening. I mean, and this in a way, of course, there are people who work for these policies. You know, what happened in the Gulf War, it was not uh, a coincidental uh, thing. You know, uh, it was planned. Uh, and the way the war was, con they never found any chemical uh, weapons in Iran, yeah. <laughs> yes. you know, and look at what happened. I, 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 I was privileged to have worked for a year and a half in Iraq. It is so sad, such a, yeah. a country that is rich in civilization. That, yeah. I mean, that is ongoing. But again, I think uh, it, it, I think it depends on the Palestinians, uh, if I may say, because unless we we work on it now and we revise a lot of things. We spoke about like the, the effectiveness of international solidarity movement. You see, sometimes you take your friends for granted and this should never be the case. I think we have to revise everything, our uh, international diplomacy, our approach to international law, our approach to human rights, our approach to our own national unity and national narrative, and also our approach to the Arab world. I do not have expectations from every, from anyone because we understand the world is, is based on interest. When you talk about states, I mean, state actors, it's, you know, I'm a realistic kind of person in a state, you know, in a world of realism where, I mean, now uh, the, the normalization with Arab countries is because Israel and some Gulf countries have uh, found a common uh, enemy. And geopolitically, it might be, re I mean, it justified, of course. I mean, th this is how they see their interest. But then how do we approach this problem? That is the challenge. As I said, I do not think that it's going to be something in the short term, but as the patriarch said, like we have to exist today. And if we exist today, this means that we have to undergo all this holistic type of revision and try to figure out how we can move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much back in that. Uh, we have a question and I'll, I'll leave it for uh, either or uh, both of you or either of you uh, to answer. This is from Salah Hassan. She said the, the film puts, uh, hello Salah, by the way. Uh, so the film uh, puts Christianity at the center of Palestine heritage, 
but it also questions the capacity of Muslim Arabs to recognize the importance of Christian Palestinians. Can you comment on this dilemma? Right, either of you can take that question. Stephen, yeah. you want to start? Stephen, can you hear us? Yeah, sorry, I muted That's myself. Right. I, I had right. a cat who decided she was, um, she was hungry. <laughs> <laughs> behind me and so she was sitting there mewing at us um and then as cats do she got bored and went on, <laughs> went on her way right moved on. Um, uh yeah i mean this is an interesting question right i i think um i'm not sure uh can you see the question I'm not sure. yeah no i i'm not sure i see the um uh I'm not sure I see the, the question of the capacity of Muslim Arabs to recognize the importance of, of Christian Palestinians in the film, but I, I'll let Lily deal with that. Um, I, think, um, I think it is, but I, I think it, it, is, it, it does bring up what, what is an actual dilemma in Palestine is that there's, there's, a lot of, um, there's a lot of power simply in terms of land holdings that exists in a very small percentage of the population in terms of Palestinian Christians, right? And, and there's, and it's not, you know, if you think about all that outward migration, um, there's always been a little bit of resentment um, that Palestinian Christians had that option to leave, right? And they have the option to go and to get the to get even if they return, they had the option to go and get educated in the United States or in Europe, in ways that, uh, at least by percentage, Muslim Palestinians didn't. Um, uh, and so, and we see that in the Exodus numbers, right? I and mean, the reason that Palestinian Christians have uh, have left in such dramatic numbers is. Um, in for no small part, the fact that they had the option to do so, right? They had the option when things got really bad um, from as a result of the occupation to go somewhere else, I guess. And, um, and so, so there is that inherent tension um, between the communities. Um, having said that, there's a lot of leadership from the, from the Christian community in, in Palestine. I mean, there's in terms of into you know, uh, Palestine, you know, in some ways, uh, Palestinian Christians are a little bit like Quakers in the United States, right? I mean, they're, they're a very small part of the population, but they're overrepresented in um, in the intellectual circles, in the thinkers of of the society, right? At the universities and so on and so forth, um, uh, and business, right? And so. Um, so it, it, it's always a dilemma, I think, to that that um, exists, and I think gets grappled with a, a little bit in the film. But but I'd like to hear Lily's comment on how she interprets an answer to the yeah. question. I mean, of course, you know, you have you have really made a good introduction, Stephen. But I think that just in general, I think. As a Palestinian, I, I I find that the Palestinian community is is naturally very tolerant, you know. I mean, when it comes to Christians and Muslims, uh, I've never seen such a situation, a society like this. And I would assume that the Arab world was the same. Look at a country like Iraq, for example, or Syria. The, the Christians have always been very prominent, and there's no or Egypt before the Arab Spring. There was never a question. So I think that there's somehow sort of like an invisible hand, that's for sure. And this is what the, the patriarch is alluding to. But the, to answer the question, how the Muslims, you see, it, it all ends up in, 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 uh, in like uh, intertwined multi-factors uh, uh, influencing the people's culture uh, and beliefs, system of beliefs in the Arab world. Now, before, during the nationalism movement, like the, the actual, the, the main nationalists in the Arab world were actually Christians. 
who really, as, as Stephen said, in, from Lebanon and Syria and uh, even in the PLO, etc. So now things are changing. You know, we have Dawaish and we have all these people. And we also have a new leadership in the Arab world that I'm, I'm not so sure that they are that much cultured in the sense of really uh, understanding what it means to be human. Like you, you see, you have young leaders uh, who are li like the, you know, in Saudi Arabia, who, who think that the, the only good thing is to imitate the neoliberal world. So we do this, we follow America, we don't see our culture, we don't see what it means to accept the other and the Christians. And the, there are problems now, you know, even though I, I say that the Palestinian society is a very tolerant society, but there are problems. Uh, and you know they are they are the result of ignorance of uh, uh, premeditated policies interference in the arab world and also lack of uh, awareness and lack of leadership also from the uh, nevertheless like for example the custodian of jerusalem is uh, is jordan and it's uh, it's a muslim king and he is the main custodian of the christian places so, you know, heritage wise, th th this is very much uh, cemented in our culture, but the way things are now, for example, Saudi Arabia now is competing with Jordan for the custodianship of Jerusalem. Can you believe it now? Like, and in a way, like, I don't want to think of conspiracy theory, but I, I, I always say there's no action that happens like all of a sudden, obviously, any action happens within a context. It's a historical context that it's an amalgam of various factors working together to come up with this result. I mean, I fear that there's a new generation in the Arab world that does not see the significance of keeping this mosaic, of, of, of protecting the culture. Uh, you saw what happened again in Iraq, how they, dis, uh, you know, destroyed churches and, uh, and this is very dangerous. This is not rational and um, it is not ending, actually. It is not ending. Now we need, like in Palestine, for example, and maybe to a certain extent we have to try and export this thing if we succeed. You know, talking about uh, uh, like a, a civilian state. Now we need to to have people focusing on, uh, you know, on good citizenship in the Arab world, accepting the other uh, equality and this kind of thing. And when we do this, maybe we can hope for a better leadership in the Muslim world. Again, it is not the same leadership. I'm I'm very. Uh, I'm, I'm very skeptic of the capacities of the new leadership in the Arab and Muslim world that is using everything for their own interest and they are losing the bigger picture, which is that this is a world and we have to all live together, uh, you know, in complementarity and uh, in a cohesive way. And uh, just to add to what you, you said, Lily, great points uh, that uh, it, we see that there is sort of a schism between leadership in the Arab world and the Arab people. Yes. That uh, the, the, the cause of the Palestinian is something that everybody you know, vibrates for, all the Arab world. And we, we, we see that uh, there's also, all, there's a clear disconnect between the leaders who act in you know, sort of, you know, sometimes irrational, sometimes um, in a very uh, indecisive, irrational, what have you. But I, if, you, if you would ask anybody on the street anywhere in the Arab world, I think wherever you go, that they feel a sense of a solidarity with the cause, with the causes of the Palestinian. They see that from area, from the Gulf to the, to the, to the Atlantic, they, they see and they are in solidarity with the Palestinians and their right to existence and their right to have a statehood and so on and so forth. So from what I see in the Arab world, there's a total, there are totally different purviews, the purview of the leaders. And most of the times, and this is why there's so much chaos on the Arab world to begin with, because there seems to be that the leaders are following um, the interests uh, of, of the, 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 the Western uh, political 
uh, elites and the, 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 the populists are on, on, the top, on, on the other side of the, 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 the equation. So um, I, I see exactly what Lilia is saying. There's, there's really, there's hope there. I see hope as well. And I'm gonna, we're gonna wrap it up with hope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and yeah. the importance of hope uh, um, that uh, the patriarch uh, has mentioned, which is important, that he said that we um, we we have to live since we live every day. Since I live today, I will live tomorrow, and I love that. Since I live today, since I exist today, since I am here today, I will be here tomorrow, and then that one day I will be the master of my own destiny. Uh, so I want to I wanna wrap up with this uh, wonderful, thing, wonderful uh, statement from the patriarch that one day we'll be the masters of our own destiny, regardless of what, um, you know, the political, um, uh, the politics, uh, regardless of the, 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 this continual denial of rights and turning the other turning the other side when Palestinians' rights are not given. He says that one day we will be the master of our destiny. And this is, I think, also reverberates very well with the rest of the Arab, the Arab world. They, they feel, uh, be it in Palestine or outside Palestine, we feel uh, that we are not masters of our destinies, that it feels that dictation from political powers uh, are, shaping, uh, are shaping our uh, lives are in our shape in our destinies that people are still grappling with that. So, but I leave it with a point of hope that the patriarch has mentioned that one day we'll be the masters of our own destiny. Thank you so much. Lily, thank you so much for coming. I appreciate uh, this opportunity to be with you and to hear, to hear from you and to learn from you. Uh, I learned a lot. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, Stephen, thank you so much uh, for being with us and for unpacking things uh, for us. And uh, Lily, thank you for unpacking all of these things and and showing us the the, the ultimate message of the patriarch, which is uh, the ability to see people as humans, regardless of where they are, and the the, the right to uh, existence and the right to um, uh, to to uh, one's owning one's destiny, which is an important aspect of any that any human strives for. Uh, thank you so much, Lily. I appreciate thank it. Thank you so much, Brahim. Thank you, Stephen. Thanks for your yeah, university you. and for all the participants. Amazing debate. Thank you very much. Thank you so thank much. You.